Sorry about that. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I don't know if it's better to go before lunch or after lunch, but uh, hopefully everyone stays awake. Let me begin by saying I am extremely thrilled and honored to have been invited to participate in today's event. And I would like to thank KU University for their hospitality, their collegiality, and their incredible generosity. Um, I would also like to commend KO for taking on in, a, in such a serious and focused manner this very important topic of how the rapid pace of technological progress challenges the very notion of what it means to be a human being. I must tell you that when my dear friend Dave Farber first invited me to participate today, I was a little taken aback because I am neither an expert in technology or computer science, nor a policy expert, nor a distinguished economist like my um, uh, co-presenters today. I am a philosopher by training. Um, and I have but a mere rudimentary grasp of what's happening in the technological and cyber worlds. But I think that's part of the point of this conference. Namely, that technology profoundly impacts each and every one of us. And oftentimes in ways we ourselves probably don't yet realize. So my initial response to Dave's invitation was to ask him for a topic. Ask him for how I could, as a philosopher, best contribute to not only the conference, but hopefully advance the mission of this new Cyber Civilization Research Center at KO. And of course, knowing me and my background and my interest the way Dave does, he immediately responded with the title you see before you, namely, the role of liberal arts education in a technological civilization. Now, this is a topic I am quite comfortable addressing, and certainly one that is of great concern to me as both a philosopher of science and an academic administrator currently serving as provost and vice president for academics at Rosemont College, which is a small private liberal arts college in Pennsylvania that celebrates the importance of the liberal arts as the foundation for a well-rounded and comprehensive education. Let me see if I can get this to Hold on a second. There you go. Okay. And while it's true that throughout my career I've been called upon to talk about the importance of studying liberal arts, I recognize there's a greater urgency to do so today in a world where technology seems to overshadow and inform nearly everything we do, and when many feel there's not enough time to study those disciplines that may not have such an obvious or direct application in the world especially when it comes to preparing for a career. Thus, one can easily reframe my topic into a question that asks, what is the role of liberal arts education in the technological world? Which for many becomes even further, is there a role for liberal arts education in technical, technological civilization? And much to my chagrin, it is typically that last question that I find myself having to address most often. In fact, it's worth my noting that before assuming my position at Rosemont, I spent over a decade teaching philosophy at Stevens Institute of Technology, a premier university devoted to technology, engineering, and innovation, where I often found myself having to defend the importance of and value of the liberal arts not only to my students, but to my engineering colleagues. And just for the record, I usually found that my students were the much more receptive audience. But I think this last formulation of the question is part of the problem. Asking whether or not there is a role for liberal arts education in any world already sets the tone and tends to put those of us who have devoted our lives to those humanistic disciplines that comprise the liberal arts on the defensive. And while I admit that there's part of me who wants to respond to this question with a terse and resounding, of course there's a role for liberal arts education, and it's no different than it's ever been, and leave it at that, I realize that would not advance or help the conversation much. 
And I also recognize that today things just may be a bit different than they've been in the past. To be fair, given the rapid pace of technological advancements, the emergence and near subsuming of digital culture, and the realization that to be successful in today's world, one needs to be, if not highly skilled, then at least adept at and comfortable with the latest technology. Then it would seem reasonable that so many would seem, see fit to question the value and utility of those non-technological disciplines. Now, of course, this is all exacerbated by the astoundingly high cost of higher education, especially in the United States, where at last estimate, student debt reached $1.5 trillion. Given that statistic and others like it, it is perfectly understandable that the focus of attention would turn to the ROI, or return on investment, given how costly the investment for a college education tends to be. But what I'd like to maintain is that the I, or investment in ROI, should be considered in other than just pecuniary terms. What about the investment of one's time and attention, and how impactful that can be on the person one becomes? How does one assess the value of that? As Michael S. Roth, president of Wesleyan University, has written, what is the ROI of a life well lived? All told, it is clear that those of us who champion the liberal arts certainly have our work cut out for us. At the same time, in an almost contradictory fashion, we see an increasing number of employers and industry experts in nearly every field telling us that the very skills that studying the liberal arts provides, things like the ability to write and speak with precision and clarity, think both analytically and critically, work collaboratively with those who have different perspectives, assumptions, backgrounds, and most important, do all of this with a refined sense of empathy and creativity. They tell us that those are the very qualities that they seek most in their employees and are the true keys to success. It seems like at least once a week, publications like Forbes Magazine, Business Weekly, and the Washington Post publish articles with titles such as these. These are actual titles of articles written in the past year or so. I like how we went from 10 CEOs to 21. The next article is probably going to be 50 CEOs who study the liberal arts. So we seem to be getting these mixed messages. Add to this the obvious need for individuals who can make reasoned moral judgments and understand the wider impact of their decisions on others in terms of both intended and unintended consequences, that it would seem one would be foolish not to study the liberal arts. Here I can easily point to recent debacles involving companies like Volkswagen, Wells Fargo, Equifax, Uber, not to mention Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, which is a whole other topic of discussion. Moreover, there have been dozens of, publication, of books published recently that laud the virtues of the liberal arts in truly compelling and oftentimes urgent ways, pointing to the perils of casually casting them aside as bereft of utility or merit. Some of my favorite books that have been published recently are, are the following. The, the uh, quotation I just read to you earlier was from this book by Michael S. Roth. Um, but in addition to that, we have books with even more provocative titles like these. And these are worth reading to you. I don't know if you can read them, but you can do anything. The surprising power of the useless liberal arts. The second one, sense making, the power of the humanities in the age of the algorithm. And that last one, one of my favorite titles, the fuzzy and the techie, which is apparently what the different um, groups were called at Stanford. The fuzzy and the techie, why the liberal arts will rule the digital world. And by the way, these are all written by technologists or computer scientists and not uh, humanists. 
There is also a category of books being published lately that looks at things from a somewhat different perspective and focus a bit more directly on the impact that technology and digital civilization have, us, have on us personally as well as socially. These include some of the following. I would especially point to the excellent work of Sherry Turkle, the MIT scholar, who examines the ways that technology affects not only what we do and how we do it, but who we become as human beings. Most notable is this last work of hers, where she looks at the ways that social media and other technological modes of communication erode our capacity for empathy, which, as we all know, is essential as the foundation of human relationships. So what all of these works have in common is the recognition, recognition that we do need to take a moment to step back and take a closer look at our technological world and perhaps look towards striking a balance between what looks like opposing sides and acknowledge the fact that treating things in purely binary terms, whether it's STEM or the humanities, tech or liberal arts, that doing this is not only far too simplistic, but I believe potentially dangerous. I must say, I was extremely pleased to learn that this very same discussion is actually occurring here in Japan as well. In doing some research for today's presentation, I discovered a number of editorial responses to the 2015 notice issued by the Minister of Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology here that called for a restructuring and in many instances eliminating of liberal arts programs in Japanese public institutions. Most compelling and gratifying for me was the countering statement issued by the Science Council of Japan, which restated its position regarding the importance of the humanities and social sciences by declaring the following, and I think this is worth reading uh, with you. It is recognized more than ever today that there is a need for the natural sciences and the humanities and so social sciences to work closely together in order to produce a more comprehensive knowledge base that can respond to the various challenges facing us today. The humanities and social sciences are integral to such a process. They play a vital role and a unique, vital and unique role in critically comparing, contrasting, and reflecting on the way in which human beings operate. I don't remember seeing any such profound statement from US scientists, but I, I might be wrong. Um, the statement goes on to declare that for the purposes of scientific integrity, it is also necessary for those who engage in natural science and technology to understand the human and social context within which scientific knowledge operates. With all these measured viewpoints and voices, one can't help but wonder why it is that we're still having these debates. Why are we still asking the question of whether there is a value in studying the liberal arts? Isn't there ample evidence that we need both technology and the liberal arts to succeed and flourish in the world? Shouldn't we, as Simone de Beauvoir once claimed with respect to the feminist question, shouldn't we say enough ink has been spilled? And what will it take to close the book on the debates once and for all? These are questions that certainly cannot be answered in one afternoon or in one presentation. It would be naive of me to even attempt to do so. Instead, what I've decided to do today is share with you some of the historical elements that I believe have contributed to these debates and most likely continue to inform the attitudes and the public perceptions, sometimes even, even subliminally, that are involved in the polarizations and the divisions. What I hope to show is just how complex the STEM versus the liberal arts debates actually are, and consider the possibility that rather than seeking to close the book on the discussions, we'd be better off to keep the conversation going. And perhaps the fact that the debates have endured as long as they have is an indication that they're worthwhile having. 
So, what are some of the factors that have contributed to the STEM versus humanities debates and the pervasive critiques of the liberal arts? I think the first to consider is a brief history of the American university. Universities in the US started out with curricula of study that were firmly based in the liberal arts, with the intention of providing an education that focused on character formation and personal development, and had as the ultimate goal producing a responsible citizenry, especially for a democratic society. However, around 1915, things started to change a bit. A debate soon arose regarding the ultimate aim and purpose of higher education, with many asserting that the focus should instead be on preparing students for professional careers. This was due in large part to the Morrill Acts of 1862 and 1890, which offered substantial federal support in the form of donated lands or granted lands for American states to then leverage in order to establish colleges where students could study agriculture and engineering. These schools would ultimately become known as land-grant colleges and include such institutions as Cornell University, Rutgers University, Penn State, UC Berkeley, and many, many others. The debate that soon arose involved two distinct camps. On the one side were the proponents of the land-grant institutions who maintained that the principal goal of higher education was career preparation, while on the other side were the more traditionalists who clung to the idea of character formation and responsible citizenship as being primary. This second group is sometimes referred to as the generalist camp due to their advocacy of a general and broad-based curriculum steeped in the liberal arts, while the former became known as the careerists. Support for one or the other of these viewpoints shifted according to things like economics, political climate, public perception, etc. It's interesting to note, I think, that there already existed a century before this public discussion and debate regarding the, public, the proper goal of education in America, with individuals like the American Founding Fathers weighing in on the topic. For example, Thomas Jefferson strongly advocated for a liberal education, especially for the ways it would promote virtue and strengthen democracy, while Benjamin Franklin infamously derided Harvard's liberal arts curriculum for being a bastion of privilege where, quote, students learn little more than how to carry themselves handsomely and enter a room genteelly, end quote. In all these instances, despite the divergence of opinions, there did always seem to be ample opportunity for healthy and productive dialogue. For example, in drafting the eponymous act Representative Justin Smith Morrill described the purpose of land-grade colleges by affirming the following. He said, quote, the higher graces of classical studies, now so greatly appreciated, will not be entirely ignored, end quote. Unfortunately, this sense of collegiality would eventually change. Many experts believe that a pivotal moment occurred about a century later, when on February 28, 1967, the governor of California gave a speech that included a statement impugning the humanities and liberal arts, damaging the reputation in the eyes of the public in ways from which they have yet to recover. On that ill-fated day, sometimes referred to as the day everything changed for higher education, Newly elected Governor Ronald Reagan belittled the liberal arts disciplines as, quote, intellectual luxuries that we could do without, declaring that taxpayers should not be subsidizing intellectual curiosity. Now, granted, the circumstances regarding these statements and their general context is much more complicated than a brief consideration will allow. Nevertheless, the damage was done, and it was deep and long-lasting. It's been asserted that from that point on, 
the tide turned entirely in the direction of the careerist camp, with most in America now believing that the sole purpose of going to college was to get a job. And worse still, that the liberal arts contributed, contributed little or nothing to that quest. Prior to that moment, the different viewpoints of character formation versus vocation had at least coexisted in what Dan Barrett, a senior editor at the Chronicle of Higher Education, has referred to as an unequal, uneasy equilibrium. But after that speech by Governor Ronald Reagan, the balance tipped towards utility in a profound and almost conclusive way. Perhaps worst of all, those statements would pave the way for other lawmakers to make similar proclamations. This included everything from Florida Governor Rick Scott's dismissive comment in 2011, questioning the need for anthropologists, to President Obama's misguided statement in 2014, demeaning the salary potential of those with degrees in art history. And while President Obama did quickly retract and apologize for that remark, once again, the damage was done. There's another contentious dispute that I believe also continues to inform these debates regarding the liberal arts, to which I would like to turn now. This one occurred about a decade before Reagan's remarks and involved a discussion about higher education occurring on what we Americans refer to as the other side of the pond. On May 7th, 1959, Charles Percy, or C.P. Snow, delivered a lecture in Cambridge titled, The Two Cultures. In this address, which was subsequently published under the title, The Two Cultures and the Scientific Revolution, Snow, both a former scientist and a practicing novelist, divided what he referred to as the whole of intellectual life into two distinct groups. The scientists, on the one hand, and literary scholars, or humanists, on the other. And between the two, according to Snow, existed a gulf of mutual incomprehension, not to mention shared suspicion, hostility, and dislike. Such a divide was not merely a barrier to cocktail party banter, as Snow frequently observed, but, he averred, actually impeded collaboration and cooperation, thereby posing a serious obstacle to real scientific progress, and ultimately a threat to Western civilization. Now, doomsday forecasting notwithstanding, what is most inciting, not to mention damaging for the humanist, in Snow's address, is the way he goes on to describe these two groups. The scientist he praises as being creatively cheerful, optimistic, always forward-looking, with the future in, the, in their bones. At the other extreme, according to Snow, were the more pessimistic and misanthropic humanists, whom he describes as natural Luddites, who respond to the optimism of the scientist by wishing that the future never exists. As if that weren't offensive enough, Snow goes on to laud the scientists as, quote, morally the soundest group of intellectuals we have, while deriding literary individuals as being frequently guilty of moral failure, pointing to poets and writers such as William Butler Yeats, Wyndham Lewis, and especially Ezra Pound, as representing viewpoints that are, quote, not only politically silly, but politically wicked, end quote. This, of course, is contrasted with the heroic spirit of the scientist, upon whom Snow claimed the salvation of the world depends. Many still maintain that, the, that much of the current public perception and enduring stereotypes regarding scientists and humanists can be traced directly back to Snow's sustained invective. As one might imagine, Snow's address set off an intellectual firestorm, vestiges of which could still be seen today. Most infamous at the time was the near immediate response 
from that so-called literary set in the form of a vitriolic essay by literary critic F.R. Leibis. In his piece titled Two Cultures? Question mark, the Significance of C.P. Snow, published in Spectator magazine, Leibis describes Snow as, quote, intellectually as undistinguished as it is possible to be, end quote, adding that the lecture, quote, exhibits an utter lack of intellectual distinction and an embarrassingly vul vulgarity of style, end quote. Snow's address, complained Leibniz, showed no evidence of scientific training or rigorous scienti scientific habits whatsoever, nor even a rudimentary knowledge of history. In his acerbic, clearly ad hominem attack, Leibniz even condemned Snow's literary abilities, declaring, quote, Snow thinks of himself as a novelist, but his incapacity as a novelist is total. As a novelist, he does not even exist. He can't even be said to know what a novel is. End quote. Leibniz continues by declaring that Snow is, quote, utterly without a glimmer of what creative literature is or why it matters. Not only is he not a genius, he is intellectually as undistinguished as, as it is possible to be. And he goes on and on. And so the tension between scientists and humanists and the disciplines they represent seemed to begin with a vengeance. Or did it just continue? It is widely acknowledged that this, no, this so-called snow Leibniz controversy and the debates it, that it fostered had a direct precursor in a disagreement that occurred nearly a century, century earlier between the English poet and cultural critic Matthew Arnold and Thomas Henry, or T.H. Huxley. The topic of this particular dispute was whether college curriculum in England, which at the time focused primarily on the humanities, especially literature, should be expanded to include science, the natural sciences. Huxley, a biologist and promoter of science education, known, uh, best known as Darwin's bulldog for his defense of evolutionary theory, had publicly advocated for a new curriculum based entirely on the sciences to the exclusion of literature. Arnold, upon hearing this, quickly shot back with an address entitled Literature and Science, where he called for a distinct privileging of literature and the humanities over and above science, claiming that given the choice, very few would actually choose to study science over literature. Throughout his essay, Arnold referred to a work that he had published a decade or so earlier entitled Culture and Anarchy, where he proclaimed that the goal of education was to study, quote, the best that has been thought and said in the world. As an aside, it is significant to note, I think, that it is quite difficult to determine what that best is. And it should come as no surprise then that this oft-quoted statement by Arnold actually would provide fuel for the culture debates and the so-called canon wars that would ensue. But that's a topic for another discussion. Putting that controversy aside, I do, however, think it is extremely worthwhile to consider Arnold's full statement in this regard, which is much richer in meaning and import than the commonly known excerpt actually conveys. What Arnold wrote in his introduction to culture and anarchy is the following. The whole scope of the essay is to recommend culture as the great help out of our present difficulties. Culture being the pursuit of our total perfection by means of getting to know on all the matters which most concern us the best which has been thought and said in the world. And here's the important part. And through this knowledge, turning a stream of fresh and free thought upon our stock notions and habits, which we now follow staunchly but mechanically. 
vainly imagining that there is a virtue in following them staunchly, which makes up for the mischief of following them mechanically. I find this quotation from Matthew Arnold to be one of the most poignant and currently relevant statements regarding the importance of critical thinking. That faculty of mind that is almost universally singled out as the most valuable and sought after of skills, and certainly the one that remains at the heart of a liberal arts education. To be critical for Arnold involves being reflexive, reflective, stepping back to examine one's notions, viewpoints, beliefs, and behaviors so as to avoid acting upon them staunchly and mechanically. For Arnold and others like him, being critical in this fashion also involves being imaginative, creative, and constructive. One of the problems that I see with the current preoccupation with critical thinking, as it is commonly perceived, is that it tends to focus a bit too much on the destructive. Far too often, critical is seen solely in the context of criticism, with many believing that the goal is to find fault with and dismiss the position of another. While it is certainly important to detect and reveal weaknesses in reasoning, especially when they lead to unjustifiable conclusions, it is just as important that one is able to recognize the potential value in opposing viewpoints or opinions. Students need to realize that before dismissing any theory or opinion outright, they need to understand why and under what circumstances that viewpoint was expressed. And that the proper way to be critical is to render judgment about something from a position that is intellectually informed and accountable. Being critical must be balanced by equal parts appreciative and speculative. It involves creativity and innovation. We need to show students the importance of not merely dismissing meanings that are weak and flawed and leaving it at that, but continuing further to create new meanings that might be better. And then, in turn, being open to the possibility that those new meanings can be replaced by ones that are even better still. Returning to the dispute between Matthew Arnold and T.H. Huxley, while the tone and tenor of the debate was much more collegial than the one spawned by C.P. Snow, their dispute, too, is often pointed to as yet another source of the prevailing antagonism between science and the humanities and the long-standing animosities that continue to prevail. Another opposition that many point to is informing the current debates surrounding the liberal arts, a contrast that in many respects is even more contrived than the others, is the one that centers on the notion of utility and contrasts contemplation with action or theory with praxis. In fact, many see the Arnold Huxley debate as merely a continuation of a familiar clash in English cultural history at that time that pitted the contemplative romantics against the more pragmatic utilitarians. Historically, this dispute found expression in the contrasting worldviews of the poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge on the one hand and the philosopher Jer Jeremy Bentham on the other, each of whom at the time had a significant cadre of devotees and followers. In fact, fellow philosopher and one time proponent himself of utilitarianism, John Stuart Mill, noted that at that time, nearly all of intellectual society divided itself into precisely these two camps, which, with each espousing a viewpoint that seemed to be entirely contradictory to the other. Writing about Coleridge and Bentham, Mill noted the following, quote, it would be difficult to find two persons of philosophic eminence more exactly the contrary of one another. Compare their modes of treatment on any subject, and you might fancy them inhabitants of different worlds." End quote. 
Now this does sound a bit like C.P. Snow and what he declared about those two worlds, those two cultures, over a century later. But unlike Snow, or most others commenting on such polarities, Mill actually advocated for a much more conciliatory and even complementary resolution, declaring that, quote, while in every respect the two men were each other's completing counterpart, the strong points of each correspond to the weak points of the other, despite this, whoever could master the premises and combine the methods of both would possess the entire English philosophy of his age, end quote. And Mill, Mill really did feel that this was possible. It was Mill's insight that there needn't be a tension between the practical and the contemplative, and that these were, in many respects, actually two sides of the same coin, both essential to human flourishing and happiness, and ultimately success in the world. In fact, I would go so far as to suggest that it is this presumed conflict between the practical and the contemplative that is actually the most dangerous, especially in today's world, when more than ever we need them to go hand in hand. This is particularly the case with respect to technology. It is one thing to be proficient in its use. It is quite another to understand how to use it in the best and most responsible way. Similarly, contemplation and theory should always bear the fruit of application and action. But of course, here too, the historical roots run deep. In many respects, this same tension between the practical and the contemplative, especially when it comes to the proper role of education, goes all the way back to ancient Greece and the 5th century BC rivalry between two opposing schools, each with a distinctly unique focus. On the one side was the school of Plato, known, of course, as the philosophers, while on the other was the school of Isocrates, referred to as the orators. For the philosophers, the focus was on wisdom and truth, achieved by taking the people on a journey of ever-increasing levels of abstraction, the goal of which was to attain a state of true knowing or contemplation. Coincidentally, I think it's interesting to note that a significant part of this intellectual training for Plato also involved mathematics, which Plato deemed as a propedeutic or a, a prelude to dialectical thinking. He, he writes about this uh, quite often throughout the, the work known as The Republic, and also, most scholars believe that over the entranceway to Plato's academy were the words, let no man, man, was man at the time, let no man enter unschooled in geometry. This more contemplative approach was in stark contrast to the methods employed by the orators, where the focus was squarely on the more practical skills of rhetoric and public speaking ultimately to be employed in public life and, and civic duty. The artist's curriculum even included for the very first time a focused study of history, with the belief that the truly learned man should be able to recite the great historians Herodotus and Thucydides and invoke their words of wisdom whenever relevant. Sorry. While the philosophers tended to extol the virtues of learning for its own sake, it was the orators who emphasized the utility of what one studied. Now, as one might guess, in somewhat of a foreshadowing of what we see today, back then it was the orator school that was much more popular than the philosophers. So even back then, the practical seemed to take precedence over the contemplative. However, by the first century AD, and throughout much of the Middle Ages, the pendulum would actually swing back toward the philosopher, especially with the emergence and codifying of the original seven liberal arts. I will now turn to a brief history of the disciplines that came to be known as the liberal arts.
The actual phrase, art artis liberalis in Latin, was used for the very first time a few centuries after the age of Plato and Isocrates by the Roman authors Marcus Tullius Cicero and Marcus Terentius Varro, both of whom flourished in the first century BC. In fact, most scholars agree that it is Varro who first identifies and names the liberal arts, recognizing them not only as organizing principles of thought, but actually for disciplines that would embody the, the, those different ways of thinking. These disciplines would eventually be grouped as follows. Grammar, logic, or dialectic and rhetoric would be, become known as the trivium, or three ways or three roads to knowledge, whereas the remaining four of geometry, arithmetic, astronomy, and music would become known as the quadrivium, or the four ways or roads to knowledge. What distinguishes these two categories of trivium and quadrivium is that the former deal with techniques of discussion and language, whereas the latter constitute what was sometimes referred to as a scientific syllabus, summarizing the principles of order in the physical universe. Of course, scientific was not at all understood or used the way we would use it today. The term scientist was actually coined around 1860 by William Huell. That's a whole other topic of discussion. Taken together, these seven liberal arts constituted the seven ways of understanding and navigating the world and our place in it, and formed the basis for a liberal education as it would be known for centuries to follow. Now, the meaning of liberal in liberal arts, as it was initially intended, had to do with being free. Free from worry or the burden of tending to more practical needs, thus clearly requiring leisure time. However, this would soon be expanded to denote the following. Free would become known as free from prejudice, bias, and preconceptions. Thus, the student studying the liberal arts should have a mind that is free and open to new ideas, and therefore capable of thinking in ways that lead to creativity and innovation. I cannot imagine a more relevant place for that sort of thinking, free and innovative thinking, than in fields like engineering, computing, and other technology-based disciplines. In fact, I would go so far as to suggest that we consider including all of the so-called STEM disciplines as being among the liberal arts, much the way mathematics was from the start. Now, that's my idea of a curriculum reform. It is in that vein that I believe that all of these contrasted disputes, whether involving scientists and humanists, STEM versus the liberal arts, or the pragmatic versus the contemplative, I believe they're all misguided from the start. And that instead, we should consider them all as necessary components of, of the same quest, especially where education is concerned. It probably will come as no surprise to anyone in this room that I am someone who firmly believes that the liberal arts and humanities are the lifeblood of a purposeful life, and that contained in great humanistic works, one finds the intellectual resources for not merely understanding, but actually solving many of the world's social, moral, economic, and even scientific problems. I maintain that by reading and discussing great works of literature, participating in philosophical debates, studying the manner in which history unfolds and historical facts are reconstructed, and examining the ways that important social ideas are embodied in cultural customs and practices, that one can acquire the skills necessary to lead a life that is both successful and perhaps most important, responsible. And while no one can deny the fact that technological competence is indispensable for getting on in today's world, we must remember that we do not use technology in a vacuum. We use it in a world of other people, with different viewpoints, different histories, different needs, ideas, 
beliefs, desires, and also different levels of technological competence themselves. So, where does that leave us today? Well, as I mentioned at the start of my presentation, in response to the question of whether there's a role for liberal arts education in today's technological civilization, the easiest thing would be for me to say, of course there is, and it's no different than in any other civilization. But I recognize, as I've said all along, that's too simplistic. In many respects, our civilization is quite different. Technology poses challenges and dilemmas unimaginable in the past, involving scenarios foreseen only by science fiction writers, which is another reason that I believe that we need the resources of liberal arts education now more than ever. Take artificial intelligence as an example. It is an incontrovertible fact that no technological development to date poses the potential to challenge what it means to be human more than AI. Artificial intelligence will continue to force us to rethink what our values are and what it means to be a human agent in the world, and even face the possibility that the very meaning of human nature might actually be subject to alteration. However, without a firm understanding of what it currently means to be human, as well as what others in the past have considered it to mean and why, our ability to reflect on how that meaning might change in the future remains severely and even perilously hampered. In addition, there are a host of other moral complexities that AI gives rise to. For example, a recent article written by a director at the World Economic Forum and published on their website listed the nine top ethical issues in artificial intelligence as follows. Unemployment, and there's a brief description of each of them. Unemployment, inequality, humanity, artificial stupidity, which I think is quite amusing, racist robots, security, evil geniuses, singularity, and I can't read the last one. Robot rights. Thank you, robot rights. <laughs> exactly. To address any one of these, what would require an arsenal of intellectual resources and tools that no one discipline could provide on its own. Nor can it be done blithely or casually. It requires the investment of time, effort, and focus. An investment, I believe, is much more precious than just tuition dollars with a return that is equally more profound. Take one particular moral dilemma having to do with autonomous vehicles that in the end may just prove, prove insoluble. It involves the best way to program the vehicle to act or behave when it is about to be involved in a crash. Should the car protect the passenger or the people in the other vehicle? And who should make that decision? the manufacturer, or the car owner. That determination alone requires careful thought from a multitude of perspectives and vantage points, and probably does not have one simple answer that covers all possible scenarios and possibilities and situations. And even then, one needs to be concerned about the sort of reasoning involved in the program, which raises issues of transparency. A recent article published by Wired Magazine told of a team of scientists who designed a way to put the decision for this, this problem in the hands of the human passenger by creating what they called an ethical knob, where one putting the switch in one direction was designated as full altruist, the other side full egoist, with the middle setting marked as impartial. One can only hope that all parties involved had at some point reflected on the difference between those important ethical theories, not to mention the concept of ethical neutrality. I can tell you that after 25 years of teaching philosophy, I myself 
don't fully understand these different positions. But I'm still trying. There is no denying that technology, including and especially AI, has great potential for doing good in the world. As Maria Rosaria Tadea, Deputy Director of the Digital Ethics Lab at Oxford University, has declared, quote, the potential for AI to do good is immense with the possibility of tackling issues from environmental disasters to financial crises, from crime, terrorism, and war, to famine, poverty, ignorance, inequality, and appalling living standards." End quote. That is all incredibly encouraging. But I firmly believe that unless we take time to reflect on what it means to do good, all of those efforts run the risk of potentially doing harm. Additionally, in this rapid, rapidly changing technological world, we must recognize that today's technology might actually be short-lived, easily replaced by something altogether new, which may require different technical skills and reasoning abilities. In fact, I found a quotation from a former Keio University president, Shinzo Koizumi, which I found to be very relevant here. He wrote the following, quote, books for immediate use will be useless books soon. Spirit and culture of mankind has been nourished by books for non-immediate use, end quote. Quite similarly, I believe that true learning is a lifelong pursuit that certainly does not end with the closing of a book. It involves the recognition that it is not the answers that matter so much as the raising of the questions, kind of what um, was referred to earlier in the previous presentation. And that sometimes the best answer to any question is actually another question. As the American philosopher John Dewey once wrote, quote, the aim of education is to enable individuals to continue their education, end quote. That, I believe, is the heart of the sort of critical thinking that the liberal arts education provides. I also draw great inspiration from the mission statement of Keio University, which I'm sure you're all quite familiar with. It's perfectly consistent, I believe, with everything I've been saying throughout my presentation. I also find this spirit reinforced in the tagline that I found emblazoned across your website that boasts of over 150 years of tradition and innovation. It's that balance that matters, just like it's going to be the combination of technology and the liberal arts, or science and humanism. In the end, I firmly believe that the mission of, the, of this university, as well as this new research center, can best be accomplished by bringing together STEM and liberal arts in ways where they mutually support, nurture, inspire, and enhance each other. And that we separate these at our peril. This was an article that I wrote a few years ago that was published in the Chronicle of Higher Education that I'm pleased to say still gets quite a, a nice response. And it's about the fact that we need to teach our students to flourish and succeed as human beings as well as professionals. Getting back to this notion that we separate these things at our peril, I, I will end with a quotation from the Greek historian Thucydides who once wrote, quote, the society that separates its scholars from its warriors will have its thinking done by cowards and its fighting by fools. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, interesting, uh, uh, a little uh, ironical argument. <laughs> <laughs>
I, I, I am not working high extension knowledge duking bank. I am a due diligence co a correspondent bank due diligence uh, analyst regarding anti bribery corruption, anti money laundering, commodity interest financing. Oh, I questions about about uh, uh, the daughter of of uh, Huawei Air founder. Uh, do you know the uh, uh, the Huawei uh, uh, CFO was arrested in uh, Canada Canada also also uh, by as per uh, request USA. What do you think about the uh, crucial uh, uh, issue? What, what do I think about there it? You go. I apologize on behalf of my countries. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, actually, Sherry um, forgot to give me back my passport. And I said, you know, it's not such a bad thing. I think I'll stay here. <laughs> so, in a way, you can't possibly. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I, I want to comment on and uh, perhaps expand very briefly on, on one of your final points there. Um, the comment that technical skills may be out of date in 10 years. Um, any university that is primarily teaching technical skills and a technical subject that is out of date in 10 years is fundamentally failing to deliver a higher education. Um, whether you're teaching rhetoric or logic, or discrete mathematics, you're teaching the fundamental skills to think about a subject. And just as in computer science, you can teach an old fashioned programming language like Fortran or a new one like Java, um, or in the humanities, you can teach how to use card catalog or how to use ProQuest. Those are not the fundamentals you're teaching. Um, now, I agree with you entirely that we should be teaching people a broad base of underlying um, things, but the, the criticism you the veil criticism you had a technical subject there is is a criticism of technical subjects in and of themselves, not a not a criticism of technical subjects that fail to account for the liberal arts. I think. Yeah, no, no, I didn't mean to imply that at all, um, and I I agree with you. It's it's the ability to think in a certain manner and apply that mode of thinking to any situation and any. Um, any software. So it's not the software skills that matter, it's the ability to use them, the ability to adapt to, to new resources. So yes, I, I apologize if that was ambiguous. A uh, question, uh, sort of comment on that. See, I had my, I graduated from undergraduate in 56 from an engineering discipline with a strong liberal arts thing. And while almost everything I learned there is gone, but the fact I learned it let me adapt to a phenomenal change in technology, and I think that's part of a technical education, is to understand how to leap forward as the, things change. I was uh, feared, uh, worried quite a few years ago, and it's toned down a little bit in the U.S., but still it's around, that who needs a college education? You know, high school is enough, I and mean, after all jobs, most jobs don't need it. And I, I'd just like to hear your, your reaction to that. I have my own, but in, in public I won't mention it. <laughs> There's such formative years. It's, it's, I would hate to deny anyone the opportunity to just learn and think, and learn how to, to think critically in the way that I described it. And to prevent anyone from having that luxury, and it is a luxury, let's be honest, but those of us who have been in the classroom and have taught 18 to 22 year olds, you know that the most important thing that we can impress upon them is that they'll, they'll never have an opportunity like that to just learn about themselves, regardless of the subject matter. That's what I tell my students all the time. Every Discipline that you study is an opportunity to learn about yourself. And I don't think there's any human being that doesn't need that. And so it, it worries me. It, it, it really it frightens me, actually. Um, by the way, I was at lunch, I, I shared um, a little tidbit of information. 
that I, I like to share with my students as well. The English term school actually has its roots in the Greek skole, which is translated as leisure. So the implication being you went to school to study, you, you studied disciplines, you studied the things that I've been talking about in your leisure time. Thank you for a wonderful discussion.